Finally, let's look at the treatment of asthma. And let's go over quickly what is in our toolbox when dealing with the asthmatic, especially the severe asthmatic. So we'll go through all the medications briefly, and then in more detail, but I'm going to go through them right now in the order that I think of them. The first thing that you're, of course, going to do is oxygen, because that's probably what they're lacking, and so you can easily put someone on oxygen. Then you can give them a bunch of other kind of medications like beta agonists like albuterol, anticholinergics like atrovent or ipratromium bromide, and steroids such as prednisone. If that's all going, you know, that's pretty good treatment. If that's not working, then I might consider giving magnesium as a smooth muscle uh, dilator as, and epinephrine as well. Now, if, if you, you're already on epinephrine and things aren't working now, it's time to up it a notch and I'd consider putting the patient on some kind of positive pressure ventilation, like BiPAP, that's non-invasive ventilation. And if they're a little bit out of it with that, you can give them ketamine to kind of help calm them down so that the BiPAP can start working. If uh, that's also not working, then you might have to go to intubation. And ketamine is actually a good drug to use with intubation because it causes some bronchodilation, so it's helpful. Now, intubation in itself does not do anything for the asthma. It's just you take over breathing for the people in case they're just too out of it or if they're too tired to breathe on their own until the other medications start working. But one medicine that you could use uh, while they're intubated is a halothane or any of those inhaled anesthetics because they also have bronchol dilatory properties. So now let's look at each one of these in turn. And we first talked about oxygen. Uh, at first, get as much as you can in, but if, if you get to in, being intubated, get, get about a pulse ox of 90%. That's where we want to get to. Next, let's talk about the beta agonists. And the main one that we talk about here is albuterol. And that's, uh, you know, the, it, it's going to affect beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. beta one's on the heart and increases heart rate contractility, and beta-2 is on the bronch bronchial airways, and this is what we want. This is what we want to get to happen, and so you can see it causes bronchodilation. It also causes some muscle tremors, so you can see that they get shaky when they're on albuterol. And albuterol can be given in many different ways. You could give it uh, via the pump, the handheld pump, the meter dose inhaler, or a nebulizer treatment. Here's the doses for each one of those. Or you can give it PO or IV. Uh, PO and IV has pretty much been shown not to be too helpful. Uh, we used to give PO to kids because I don't know why, because you can use a spacer and a mask and, they're, and you're able to give them uh, MDIs that way. Now you can ask yourself, what about MDI versus NEBS? Are they equivalent? And there are studies that show that, yes, they are equivalent in maybe mild to moderate asthma, but not in severe asthma, number one, because the severe asthmatic cannot coordinate themselves enough to hold the pump and, and coordinate all of that. Uh, and number two, a, a, a continuous NEB is like getting a pump every 30 seconds. There's no way that uh, they're going to be able to do that. And it's just easier to put a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, albuterol in the nebulizer and then you can walk away instead of having to keep sitting there and pumping it. So I would say for the severe asthmatic, they are not equivalent. Now there's another albuterol out there. It's called leave albuterol because, as you know, there are enantiomers, right-handed and left-handed uh, enantiomers. And supposedly the, the L, the left-handed enantiomer, the uh, L albuterol is more beta 2 selective, so it's going to cause less heart rate uh, increases and less of that other stuff. But you know what? The studies have not shown that it's really that much more helpful, so just use normal albuterol. Now, if you want to know how this thing works, we can get into all that stuff. You know it's a beta 2 receptor that blah 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 something G protein, blah 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 cyclic AMP, and then it causes all of these things to happen, which are all the good things that we want to see. Now, usually along with the albuterol, we give Atrovent. That's the brand name. Ipratropium bromide, that's the generic name. And what that is, it's an anticholinergic, like atropine is anticholinergic. And what this does is it blocks the acetylcholine from hitting these receptors over here, and that causes downstream smooth muscle contraction. So by blocking it, you get smooth muscle relaxation. And it works better in the bigger airways, where the beta agonists work, better in the smaller airway, so it's an additive response. You give both of them together for, for a, a synergistic response. Nearly everyone else who comes to the emergency department is also going to get steroids. And you know, steroids, what they do is it binds to a protein in the cytosol, which then all together moves into the nucleus and affects protein 
uh, formation. And all this does, you know, it works to reduce inflammation and increase beta responsiveness. And there's two kinds of steroids that we're going to commonly use, the PO steroids and the IV steroids. Uh, inhaled steroids do not play a role in the ER. They are great. They're great, great, great for uh, preventive, preventing attacks, but they don't do anything uh, for the, for the acute exacerbation. And we know it takes hours, maybe four hours, for steroids to kick in, so get them in early. And so those are the things that most asthmatics are going to get. And let's say that's not kicking it, that's not working. You need to do more, so now we need to up our game. And so at this point, I'd consider giving some magnesium. And how does magnesium work? It's probably a calcium antagonist, and therefore uh, is a smooth muscle relaxer. There's not much downside to give it, giving it, unless you give huge doses like they do on the OB floor, uh, in which case you, you can get uh, some obtundation and you know decreasing of reflexes, etc. But we're not giving those big doses. We're giving two grams over 20 minutes. The next drug that I would consider the severe asthmatic is epinephrine. And perhaps the, your patient is in such distress that not, everything that you give through the airways is just not getting there. And so maybe we need to use a different route, IV or IM. And epinephrine is a very complicated drug in the way that it's, it's uh, labeled. It comes in two forms. There's a 1 in 1,000 and a 1 in 10,000 dilution. Okay, and so we, if you're going to give something IV, you want to do it the 1 in 10,000 because you don't want to give concentrated epinephrine in because it's going to cause all sorts of cardiac problems. So you want to give the more dilute version, the 1 in 10,000 dilution. And what that means is there's 1 milligram in 10 mLs uh, in in these things and so you could take like the epi that you get out of the crash cart and if you did you'd have to dilute it you can if, if you wanted to dilute it out you can give them this is for someone who's really about to die you know you could give them 0.25 ml quarter ml that's giving them a huge dose of epi 25 mics uh, this is a little calculation there if you want to see 0.1 mg milligrams per ml it shows that there's about 100 milligrams per ml and that's how we get 25 here now if you want to give the im dose you're going to use something that's a little bit more concentrated, the 1 to 1,000. You're going to give 0.3 milligrams IM, usually like in the deltoid. And if they're still not doing too hot, then you might want to start them on an epi drip. And the dose you're going to want to give is 1 microgram per minute. And uh, just have the pharmacy make it up. I drew a little picture here. If you want to pause it, you could see how you could make it up yourself, but I'd rather you just have the pharmacy do it. Next thing that I'll do if they're still not doing so well is put them on BiPAP. And what BiPAP is, if you haven't seen it before, it's a ventilator, but you don't put a tube in them. You put a mask on their face, and it basically shoves air down their nose and throat. So it pushes air in. It seems kind of odd that these guys have trouble getting air out, and why are we shoving air in? Uh, but, but we'll talk about that. But it has been shown to reduce hospitalizations and reduce the need for intubation. So you shove the air in really fast, and then you let the air come out slowly on its own. Then you shove the air in really fast, and what that does is it takes some of the work for breathing away from the patient. Now, there are some complications that can happen uh, from endot endotracheal intubation, as you can see over here. And so if you can avoid intubating an asthmatic, it's a good idea. Now, BiPAP is only good for people who can take it. Uh, that they, they don't freak out with this mask on their face that's shoving air down their throat. Now, they're already very anxious and they're already a bit confused, uh, and they might try to rip that mask off of their face thinking that it's suffocating them, while in actuality it's giving them air. And so in those patients, it's not going to work. It has to be someone who can cooperate. If they can't cooperate, then I've tried giving a sub-intubating dose of ketamine, so half a milligram per kilogram. And ketamine is a... It's a you know, it's a sedative of sorts. It's a non -disso it's a um, dissociative uh, anesthetic, and it's great for getting rid of the agitation. Now, it is also a bronchodilator, so it could be useful in that respect. But it's not a strong bronchodilator. It's good. Hey, anything helps, right? If you're going to intubate them, then you can also give them a full dose of ketamine. So let's say you decide, oh man, everything we did is not working, the bypass not working, they're getting agitated, they're getting hypoxic, and they're tiring out, their respiratory rate is dropping from 20 to 10 to 6 to 4, it's not looking good, now it's time to consider intubation. And that's where you actually put an ET tube in, and you put them up on the ventilator. And we already talked about there are all kinds of problems that can happen with uh, intubating a patient that's an asthmatic. And it all comes from this over here. 
And so what happens is, remember we told you that air goes in easier than it does than it comes out in the asthmatic. It's very difficult for them to exhale the air. And so what that means is uh, the pressure is going to build up because the air is coming in, they can't get it out. Then more air comes in, they can't get it out. Then more air comes in, and they can't get it out. So you can see the lungs are going to hyperinflate. The pressure builds up. This is called auto PEEP. PEEP stands for positive end expiratory pressure. Uh, but at the end of exhalation, there's pressure, and they're doing it to themselves because of their derailed airways. That's hence the auto. So as the pressure builds up, what's going to happen? It's going to squish the vena cava. So venous return is going to decrease, which means cardiac output is going to decrease, which means they're going to become hypotensive and eventually code. They can also pop their lungs and get a pneumothorax. They could get bilateral pneumothoraces. And all of this happens because there's not enough time for the air to come out. So how do, what do we do about that? So the key to this is to make sure that uh, if whatever settings we use, that we give plenty of time for the air to come out. So in order to make that happen, we have to push the air in quick. Push it in quick so there's time for air to come out. So how do we do that? Well, a couple of things. Uh, most of us are probably breathing about 12 times per minute. And if you think about it, most of that time is spent in inhalation and a very short time in exhalation. And so that's where we're going to have to flip that around, okay? So first thing we can do is we can decrease the respiratory rate a little bit so that there's a lot more time there for the exhalation to happen. And so maybe set it at six to eight. If you're bagging them, uh, one thing you might do, you know, when you're very nervous, you're going to breathe, you're going to be pumping that bag very fast and that's going to cause auto peep, is maybe just Check your own breathing, and every for every breath you every two breaths you take, give them one breath. Now there's something on the ventilator called the I to E ratio. That's the time spent in inhalation to the time spent in exhalation. And we said more time is normally spent in inhalation than exhalation. On the ventilator, you can flip it. You can say spend more time in exhalation than you do in inhalation, and that's called you know inverting the I to E ratio. Another way of doing that is increasing the inspiratory flow rate. Normally is about thirty. You make it about 100, right? So if the air goes in faster, it's going to take less time. That means each breath is going to be spent, uh, most, more time of it's going to be spent with exhalation. And finally, let's look at some drugs that have been shown really not to be too helpful. Leukotriene inhibitors inhibit, inhibit leukotrienes, which do all these bad things here, right? Uh, and so if we inhibit it, we'll hopefully avoid these bad things from happening. And they are maybe good for chronic treatment, but they have not been shown to be helpful for acute treatment. Another drug are, the, are drugs that are called methylxanthines, and those really, there's really no evidence to show that they're helpful either, so that's all we'll talk about those. And one last one we'll talk about is Heliox, which is a mixture of 20% oxygen and 80% helium, and the thought is that this is actually a, a drug, or a, a gas that flows more smoothly through uh, airways, and so those narrowed airways, it's not going to cause any turbulent flow through there, and so it's going to go in more smoothly, and so that also the evidence is kind of out on that. But if you think about it, look, it's 20% oxygen, and we want our patients on 100% oxygen. And so, uh, you know, there's some severe limitations with this as well. And so that's an overview of the drugs that we would use in the treatment of asthma, especially the severe asthmatic.